Also, that woman in red who was happy about getting my book, that was the most pleasure I've ever given one person. In <laughs> so thank you. Very much. <laughs> I'm honored uh, to speak to you and grateful for the opportunity. Um, I come nominally as a representative of the Dead Tree Media. In my particular magazine, I am relatively sure we create the highest ratio of dead trees per published story in the history of journalism. Um, and But the distinction between online communication and off is blurring rapidly as you all have made clear every day, and it should blur, it should disappear, and I think hopefully some of the dead tree things won't disappear, but the distinction might. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the changes that I've seen in the time that I've been writing about science, and a bit about the reaction to this book I wrote, which has not always been completely um, warm. Um, I wrote it because I feel we have to come to, we've come to some sort of I don't know, crazy crossroads where we have never been more scientifically successful or adventuresome as a society. Um, yet a larger number of educated and often thoughtful people have never been so ambivalent about or downright opposed to the idea of progress. It's baffled me then and it baffles me now. People often take stances that are immutable on matters of health that will have consequences that they never consider and that almost always will deliver exactly the opposite of the results they are seeking. The truth is, some of the good of what good people do in the best of intentions, in the name of protecting their family's health, saving the world, sustaining the planet, it has the power to kill people. I, I, I really mean that. And those of us who write about what science can and cannot do, we need to fight that in every possible way, and we need to be very vigorous and aggressive about it. Um, I just want to make a random and somewhat anecdotal, unsupported by studies comment um, <laughs> about the current state of science writing in general. Uh, it's phenomenal and getting better every year, every month. Um, I often hear the opposite, um, but I don't know who, may, who, how such assertions can be made except by people who have no frame of reference. Writing on science has become broader and more sophisticated than it ever has been more integrated with the great issues of all our lives, and necessarily so. And believe me, it wasn't always this way. When I started writing about science, which was um, horrifically about 25 years ago, I was a young reporter at the Washington Post, and here's how I came by my cool, highly sought after specialist job. In 1986, the space shuttle Challenger blew up 73 seconds into a flight that carried among other astronauts the first teacher into space. It was a signature catastrophe of, for American technology, and it struck deeply at our conception of ourselves as a country. Um, my job at the Post at the time was mostly to cover the parking lot at National Airport. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually serious. You know, we're trying to find out if senators were cheating and their mistresses were parking it. I, I never got that story. Um, and we also didn't have cell phones, so I had to call in from time to time because the parking lot was distant. Um, I'm serious, I covered the parking lot. Um, I called in one morning and my editor said, he was quite, got on the phone, all agitated. He said he was about to send someone to get me. And I said, why? And he told me the shuttle had exploded. And I replied, well, it must have been near New York because I've been at National all morning and I, I would have known it. <laughs> the space shuttle, you idiot. <laughs> so I was sent immediately to Florida because we had certain weaknesses in our staff that allowed a person who knew nothing to go there. And I was eager and hard working, but I was, I was stunningly, cripplingly ignorant of the thing I was writing about. And Bill Broad of the New York Times, who later became my colleague when I was there, took pity on me, and he helped me every day. And so every day I had a story that was good enough not to look like a complete idiot, but never quite good enough so that any one of his employers would say, hey, did you see the post today? Um, <laughs> but that was fine, that was fine, I could do it. Um, and I went home, um, and uh, the national editor asked me if I wanted to write about AIDS. And why did he ask me that? Because no one else really wanted to. I, honestly, honestly. 
this is arguably the defining story of our, or at least of my era as a journalist. And the story changed the world of science writing forever, as far as I'm concerned, because before it came along, no one cared, and now people do. And it was on the front pages for months at a time. And it was dumped on me because other people were more interested in Senate races and caucuses and reporting on federal budget wrangling in Capitol Hill. And that was my luck. I started doing it, and again, I didn't know shit. I didn't know what a red blood cell was. But um, I had smart colleagues who were very generous, and I had a science editor that some of you may know or have run into, Boyce Rensberger, who was fantastic, and he kind of just turned my job into graduate school. And I learned, I learned how to do it, and it was thrilling, and I stumbled onto this magical secret. As I learned more and wrote, not just about HIV and other diseases, and space and genetics and food and smoking issues and public health issues throughout the world, I never got bored, and I always used to get bored. I'm easily bored, I'm a journalist. And it never has gotten boring for me. In the early days, I was always seen as a little weird to do this, because I, why would you do that? I mean, why would you do that if you could cover the president? You know, Ronald Reagan was there. I could have written about it. Um, but I don't think that is the case anymore. I don't think people think that way. I think science matters, and people even realize that science matters. Every story in our lives, from the food we eat to the economic decisions we make, to how we use the internet or deploy drones over Afghanistan, or decide to get a flu shot or not to get a flu shot because they're so dangerous. Um, <laughs> are based, well, well are, they're based on cascading sets of data, and it's data for which we need to provide context. The internet has made it so easy to do that. Um, it's also made it so impossible to do that. Um, because as the sea of information gets deeper, we tend to flail about even more when we look for what is real and what is not real. Um, and I think this is a real problem for our age, um, and we haven't solved it, and we need to solve it. We always have to remember something in the democratic era of the internet. What is popular is not necessarily what is best. It's not even necessarily what is true. And if you take your information from the University of Google, um, you may not know that, and it can be very damaging. And I'm, I take a lot of information from that university. But, but you have to understand that we, we are just relying on what we see, and we're losing our ability to sift through information. And I think that's one of the real challenges we face today, and I think it's a principal reason why there is denialism out there. Um, and I guess you guys know what I mean by that, but denial, everyone knows. You get depressed, something's wrong, you don't want to face it, you don't admit it. We all do it. It's common, I think it's probably healthy once in a while. But when a society does it, it isn't healthy, and it has tremendous ramifications that I think are almost always negative. And I think we're doing that more and more and more in a variety of areas. I focus on some. Uh, some people, and I'll get to this too, have suggested I should have focused on others. But you can't win them all. Um, because information doesn't really come with a brand anymore, it's tough to know who to trust, what to value, or how to evaluate them. <coughs> People throw their hands up all the time and say, how are we going to deal with this now? Even now, as traditional papers and magazines cut way back on their coverage of nearly everything, I am not one to lament the death of science journalism. It isn't dying. It's a huge challenge to make it profitable, both for institutions and for you guys. Um, it's, it needs to be made easily understood, but not dumbed down, consumed by masses. Um, that's, not, that's a difficult chore, but we have to do it. And I think we have the skill, the talent, and the energy. Um, and looking out at this group, I kind of do feel that we do. And I actually am starting to feel we might even have a government that's capable of it at the moment, though they're a little sidetracked, but they're going to get there. Um, I wrote the book because it came to feel we all really need to look at our assumptions about a lot of basic things again and talk about them in different ways. I put it off for many years. I did that for a variety of reasons. One is, I'm a journalist, and we don't like to work. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's true. Um, but another possibly deeper reason for me is, um, this seems clearer. 